Good morning. Welcome to the BYE Real Estate Webinar Series. My name is Barrett Slade, Professor of Finance, and it's my pleasure to host the webinar today. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to announce that on October 7th, I'll be hosting Don Slyke, recently retired president and CEO of Farmland Reserve, Inc. and Ag Reserves, Inc. His presentation is titled, All Acres Are Not Created Equal, Investing in Ag Real Estate. It should prove to be a quite, uh, quite an interesting webinar, so we invite you to attend. We'll be sending out an invi invitation to that webinar in the coming days. Please note that after our guest speaker concludes at 11.35 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A, and then we'll conclude at 11.45 a.m. If you have questions for the speaker, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type those in. Today we have with us Julie Kilgore, president of Wasatch Environmental, an environmental science and engineering firm based out of Salt Lake City. She has over 30 years of experience in environmental assessment, investigation, remediation, and regulatory agency coordination. Julie, it's so great to have you with us today. We invite you to uh, share with us a little bit of your background and go ahead and present your material. Great. Thank you well, for thank us. you. And I appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, I am a native of Utah, born and raised here, and uh, have an environmental engineering firm here in Salt Lake City. Uh, one of the other things that uh, I I do is uh, chair the task force that developed the phase one standard that everybody uses for environmental due diligence. And so I'm excited to be able to share with you uh, some of that uh, information and, and be able to answer any questions that you might have on this uh, environmental due diligence process. Let me go ahead and set up uh, the slide material that I wanna share with you today. Understanding our environmental due diligence for real estate transactions and development projects was really the focus um, of our discussion today. It really starts back in 1988, for my piece of this anyway, with the uh, uh, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act of 1980. This is CERCLA, and this is what set up this big fund of money, this pot of money to uh, clean up abandoned sites where there was no responsible party, and then to give a mechanism for EPA to get some of that money back. So this legislation has been around for a long time and many of you are probably aware of it. That's what sets the stage for the due diligence that we do for commercial real estate transactions. Because under CERCLA, there's a very broad liability scheme, past owners and operators, present owners and operators, Sellers, buyers, in, in, case, in some cases, lenders have been held responsible for these response costs back to EPA on these large projects. The all appropriate inquiries, uh, the state of the current practice uh, is, is conducting the all appropriate inquiries prior to acquisition. There was a key piece of legislation in 2002 that was, that was promulgated to get these, these Brownfields properties, which is somewhat defined as properties that are, are contaminated or um, uh, perceived to be contaminated and are abandoned or underutilized because of the contamination and get those back into productive use again. But what this requires is to do this all appropriate inquiries prior to acquisition. So you can get a handle on, on how, what might be present and what you, you might be obligated to uh, contend with after purchasing property. So the, uh, the EPA developed a regulation sort of outlining what this all appropriate inquiries should look like. And it was very consistent with what we've been doing in industry for, for a couple of decades before that. Uh, but what EPA did then is to reference back to an ASTM standard on phase one environmental site assessments as being compliant with that EPA regulation. So that's how those two things work together. And that ASTM task group is the one that I chair we just finished up another four years of negotiation for a, a revised standard that, that you should see coming out uh, probably in November or December of this year. So it's important to stay current on the tools that we are using to help prepare us for acquisition of a, a commercial property or a redevelopment project. That is probably the most 
brief background I've ever given on the legislative background for why we're doing environmental due diligence, but I wanted to get right into some key terminology and, and cases specific, especially to our area. And, and one of the things I like to clarify with uh, non-environmental professionals is what the heck is a wreck? What is a wreck? A recognized environmental condition. This is, this is the core of the outcome of doing a phase one environmental site assessment. And any of you who have been involved in commercial property transactions should be somewhat familiar with at least having heard this term. And what this term is, is the presence or likely presence of a hazardous substance or petroleum product on the property under conditions that suggest there may have been a release. That's the objective under these federal laws is identifying the presence or likely presence that we might have contamination. Now the presence part of it is pretty easy. We have data, so we know there was a release. We see a release, we see contamination on the ground. Uh, most of the time that's not the case, it's not that apparent. The challenge is the likely presence. What does it mean to have the likely presence of contamination on a property? And the thing that I have to remind people is that proof is not required to meet this test, right? This, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's say you have a gas station or a service station. It's operated on the property from the 1940s through the 1970s. There's no government records of underground storage tanks or releases. Nobody was looking back then. So you're not gonna find any agency records suggesting releases. The question that the environmental professional has to ask themselves when they're doing a site like this is, if I go drill or if I start digging on a site that was used as a gas station or a service station for 30 years, what's the likelihood that I'm gonna find contamination? Generally, the answer to that question is, it's pretty high. We're likely to, to, to find a release that would meet the definition of that recognized environmental condition. But I'll give you another one that's coming up a lot these days where we have dry cleaners. Um, I just did mentioned we've just come out of three or four years of negotiation in the task group. I have about 250 people on this task group, uh, environmental professionals, lenders, buyers, lawyers, and EPA and other state agencies. And one of the things that they brought to us was that um, when there's been investigations done, whether it's through SBA, Small Business Administration, which is a large funder of, of small businesses, which is often what a dry cleaner is, and also an, a government agency in the Midwest that had just established a dry cleaning fund. And what we are consistently finding in industry is that when sampling is conducted on dry cleaners, better than 80% of all dry cleaners have had impacts, uh, you identify impacts that exceed some type of uh, regulatory, regu uh, regulatory threshold. That's significant and that's information that environmental professionals and buyers and developers need to be aware of. That is a likely presence. You have a very high probability that if you're looking at a site that is or has had a dry cleaner on it, you've got the likely presence that we've had a release on that property and some evaluation needs to be conducted. There are other categories once a, a release has been identified and you will see this in your environmental due diligence reports. Remember the recognized environmental condition is the presence or likely presence that a release has happened. But what happens when those are addressed and have perhaps a no further action letter? Well, we have a couple of buckets for those. So one of them we call a historical recognized environmental condition. And what that means is we've had a release it's been addressed and it now meets some, it now meets unrestricted use criteria. I call it eating dirt and drinking water standards, right? Nobody cares what you do with the dirt. Nobody cares what you do with your construction dewatering. You don't have any contamination present that exceeds any regulatory threshold. Historical recognized environmental condition. Once it was there, now it's gone or gone enough that nobody cares. The other one is a little more complicated because we're not typically required to clean up to the way nature made it. We clean up good enough for now. We accept the balance of risk reward, cost benefit. So these risk-based closures are very, very common. 
and what the and we call these controlled recognized environmental conditions. And that's your key. That's your indicator. A controlled rec says you've had a release. It's been addressed to some risk-based standard, and you need to be aware that it's there and you have an obligation to manage it properly. This is particularly important on a redevelopment project where you might have a change of use or you're gonna be excavating or you're gonna be dewatering or even if you're just going to buy an existing building but you're gonna change the use of the building. And I'm gonna share a couple of examples to, to emphasize these points. Here's an example in Salt Lake where we had a no further action letter back from 1999 for a, a small tank that was taken out next to a warehouse and they got enough of the contamination out but they couldn't get all of it some of it went under the building but the sampling data was sufficient to say you know it's okay as long because it's a warehouse right so they, the agency closed the case well fast forward to 2014 there's a new phase one done the seller the owner is now going to sell the property Seems that they didn't understand that they had some residual contamination left on that property. It's an easy thing to forget when it's out of sight, out of mind. And it is still mostly an office, but the warehouse piece of it, they'd converted some of that to little apartments. Okay, well, now we have a residential use on top of some residual contamination. So when we apply these terms, if we have a no further action letter, some mistakenly think that by definition, the agency has closed the site. So it's a historical recognized environmental condition. We don't need to worry about it. But that wasn't the case here. We had some residual contamination. The agency says, that's okay for now because it's a warehouse. Uh, and that's fine if it's gonna continue to be used as a warehouse. But when they put the little apartments in there, we now have a use of the property that is inconsistent with the data that supported the no further action letter that was issued by the agency. We call that one a, an open uh, recognized environmental condition and we need to do what something and that's a conversation. Do we want to keep the apartments? If you want to take the apartments out and make it a warehouse again, you need to do nothing. You want to keep those apartments in there we need to get some new data and maybe have some additional mitigation to, to, to meet the requirements of residential use. And I'll give you another example. And again, this is relevant to Park City, to Harriman, to West Jordan. We have a lot of this going on right now where we have impacts from mining. Now in Park City, this example is specific to the, to the soil ordinance that they have in Park City. Where the entire town is subject to a soil ordinance. And so every single parcel in town has to demonstrate one of two things. We need to demonstrate that uh, the, 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 there's, there's a, a layer of contamination pretty much throughout the area of lead and arsenic, just from airborne emissions from the old mining days. Well, if you can demonstrate that that's been removed and you have data that shows that the remaining soils have unrestricted use levels, or just document that you have 18 inches of clean fill on top of that uh, assumed, you don't even have to sample it, they just assume you have contamination. So you can have either 18 inches of clean fill or take it off. So if you take it off and you have data, if you scrape it and you have data that shows what remains here meets unrestricted use criteria, you have a historical wreck. Once it was here, now it's gone, do what you want with the property, nobody cares. Uh, if you put the clean fill, you document you have 18 inches of clean fill, that's a cap and it essentially is fine as long as you don't dig into it. If you dig into it, then you have some management obligations. That's why we call it a controlled wreck. It's fine as long as it's controlled properly. If you don't have one of those two things, we have a recognized environmental condition and we, gotta, we have to do some work to get it figured out. The real point to this, and, and let me again emphasize that this is happening in Harriman and out, out on the West Valley side where there's a lot of development going on right now. There's a lot of old, uh, there's a lot of old mining uh, impacts, lead and arsenic, just from the outwashes, from the creeks and the flood zones. And so they're requiring environmental clearance before you can do your developments. The primary point to this is all regulatory closures are not created equal. That is so important to know. All no further action letters are not created equal, right? A CERCLA 
no further remedial action plan is not the same thing as a leaking underground storage tank, no further action letter, which is not the same thing as a voluntary cleanup program certificate of completion, which is not the same thing as a division of waste management and radiation control, no further remedial action required. And none of those things by definition mean no constituents of concern remain. So it's very important when you're looking at buying property, you're looking at a development where impacts have happened, what that no further action letter actually means. But one of my favorite set of slides, the interesting thing about environmental is that um, there really is no value added engineering to environmental professionals on your job site, right? There's this legacy contamination that it's like a, it's like musical chairs, right? Whoever is left holding the bag when the music stops, it's your baby. So, but um, so people work really hard. It surprises me how much effort is put into getting out of doing the environmental due diligence. So I have a set of slides that I call the wine slides. Why do I have to do a phase one? Why, oh, why do I have to do a phase one? So I'll start with some of the basics. First of all, because Congress says so, right? At a federal level, if you want a landowner liability protection to protect you from cost recovery from EPA, just in case you accidentally buy the next Superfund site, you have to have all appropriate inquiries prior to uh, closing on your property. Why do I have to have a phase one? Well, I will say that because every property that you look at, it doesn't always look contaminated. It would be so easy if they all looked like this. You wouldn't need me. But I'll share with you a story that happened out in Tooele County. An acquirer of this hillside, they wanted the gravel, did a swap with the farmer. And they un knowing and and why do a phase one they're out in the middle of nowhere there's another residential neighborhood nearby there's nothing going on out there why should we spend all that money on a phase one and it turned out they accidentally acquired free of charge because it was a land swap the north end of the jacobs smelter superfund site now here's what happens when you buy a piece of a superfund site without doing any all appropriate inquiries prior to acquisition you now just became a potentially, you became a responsible party. And when EPA found out that UDOT bought this property, deep pocket, they did not hesitate sending, uh, sending them a bill for a quarter of a million dollars as their contribution to the Superfund cleanup because they had no landowner liability protection. Here's another example. This is how your site might look today. All kinds of new development, new multifamily housing, bunch of new commercial going on. Uh, don't forget, this is what it used to look like. So there's a lot happening in Geneva. A lot has happened in Geneva. Consistently throughout the area, we have elevated levels of, of the heavier hydrocarbons, PAHs, there's elevated metals. We've got a few groundwater plumes out there. It's not a good time to find out you have environmental problems after you've built your building and you go for permanent financing. There's a lot of shoddy environmental work that has been done out here on Geneva, churning and burning phase one environmental site ass assessments to give buyers and developers answers they want. And then something comes back later and you got more you got to deal with. It's much better to deal with this on the front end and because then you can work a little bit better at penciling these things out doesn't mean that they're showstoppers. It just means you got to rework your performance to make sure that this thing's going to pencil out. Why do I have to do a phase one? There's already been a phase one done here. I have one that was done in 2008. Why do I need to do another one? Good question. First of all, because EPA says you have to. The EPA All Appropriate Inquiries Regulation requires that you have certain components updated within 180 days of acquisition, but any phase one that's over a year old, EPA wants to see a new phase one done. We can use the older phase ones as um, a resource, uh, but, they're, but they're not just slapping a cover letter on it saying, yeah, we agree with their conclusions and it all looks good. So yeah, so after one year, 
all the phase one uh, needs to be redone. So EPA says, you better get something current. And I can tell you a few reasons why. Uh, first of all, as a buyer, you have to satisfy your own buyer obligations that are outlined in the, in the process that demonstrates what you did or did not know prior to acquisition. But you know, there's a lot of questionable reports and I'll share with you just a few of them. Here's one that was sent to me. I don't even remember what part of the country it was from, but because I chair the ASTM task group, I get a lot of, I get a lot of emails with a lot of stories, but the client on this, when they sent me uh, this aerial and she says, I just got this phase one. Can you take a look at this and tell me what you think? The consultant says that the aerial photographs are showing that the, the property has always been residential. And if you look closely at the aerial, and I don't think you really have to look all that closely, you can see houses along the road, but you know, in my neighborhood, most of the time a house is not surrounded by asphalt with two concrete pads facing both streets. Convince me that's not a gas station. Somebody just wasn't looking closely enough. Another thing that I see in old phase ones is somebody not paying much attention when they're doing the site visit. In this particular case, this was here in Salt Lake, the prior phase one did not identify any, um, any concerns or any tanks. And in fact, the owner who'd owned this property for 60 years didn't have any, said he hadn't had any tanks. Well, when you do the site visit, when you look on the back of the, does anybody recognize what that is right there? Right in here on the back corner of the warehouse building, you've got four vent lines from an underground storage tank system. So I went back in and I talked to the key manager. I said, I said Brad, you, you said you didn't, hadn't had any tanks here. So we haven't had any tanks. I said, you've got four vent lines off the back of your warehouse. And I hear this a lot. He looks at me and he said, oh, you know, now that you mention it, we did. We had three 10,000 gallon diesel tanks back in the backyard, but we took those out way back in the 70s. Okay, two questions. If you've had three 10,000 gallon diesel tanks for 20 years back in the backyard, what's the likelihood that you've had a release? Pretty high. Second question. Okay, that accounts for three vent lines. I see four. So it, up to the taking this building down, I was waiting to see where we were going to find the waste oil tank because I would have bet my bottom dollar that's that what was that's what was left. And I'll tell you on a redevelopment project, this particular site, what had happened is yes, indeed, there was a release from those diesel tanks, but the concentrations that were there were above what we call initial screening levels, but below what we call tier one screening levels, commercial levels. And it was just gonna be a parking lot for a new shopping center. So nobody cared. Uh, and they didn't need to do any mitigation until the stormwater design came in and they had to dig this whole area up and dewater for two weeks while they put the system in. You can't dewater diesel impacted groundwater under their construction dewatering permit with the contamination. So what was a non-issue became a $70,000 issue that nobody had penciled in. Uh, be very careful also, here was a phase one that was done on a site. They didn't exactly, they didn't ask the question of how the building was heated. And it's very easy to overlook a, a, a fill port and a vent line for a heating oil tank between the flower pot and the rake. They just, they just missed it and they didn't ask the questions. Another one that we see a lot and you will find these if you're gonna be digging up a slab are these old oil water separators. And the way these things are constructed, if they're not well maintained, contaminant petroleum, right? Rises to the top, chlorinated solvents sink to the bottom. The cleaner water goes through a couple of stages in the oil water separator and off to the sanitary sewer system. Well, these things are not taken care of. They back up and that's what it's going to look like. Nothing finds bad stuff better than a track hoe. So when you start digging up, when you start taking up slabs and you've had service or floor drains and oil water separators, uh, you can either find it when you start digging or you can do a little pre-acquisition diligence so that you know what you might be dealing with. Another challenge that I see with some of these old reports, especially with consultants who are squeezed by their clients to not find a problem. 
Okay, I've seen some very creative conclusions. So here's one that came to me. Uh, they wanted me to take a look at this phase one report. It had been auto repair in the 30s and 40s, a gas station in the 50s and 60s. They didn't know what the heck it was in the 70s through the 90s, but today it was a fast food restaurant. And the consultant's report said, no recognized environmental conditions because they didn't have any documentation of releases. That's how, they, that's, how they, um, that's how they couched it. But what they said was, however, past use of the auto repair gas station is a business environmental risk. That is a cop-out. That is a consultant that does not want to make the hard answers or is trying to give you an answer they think you want. What that says is, I'm not going to make the decision. You make the choice yourself. And that's not what you hired these folks to do. So the, the client called this person back there. It's down in Florida. He says, don't you think we should just check? And the consultant said, no, you don't need to do a phase two because anything that was released that long ago is going to be gone by now. That's when they called me and they asked me what I thought about that. And I told them, I said, you know, I'm just a girl from Utah. And in Utah, we don't have magic dirt. Maybe in Florida, they have magic dirt, but I've dug up a lot of gas stations and service stations from the 50s. And yeah, you better go check. That's not a good, not a good one. This is one that I'm seeing a lot these days. And I wanna emphasize again, to be very, very careful. If you are looking at a site that has or has had dry cleaning. So this, this is just a recent case, but I have a dozen more just like it. It's a drop-off cleaner, drop-off dry cleaner, right? The buyer hires a local consultant to do a phase one. It's a shopping center with a dry cleaner and it's a drop-off only. And here's what I see the consultants do. It's listed as a RICRA, that's a Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. That's the, that's the, the, the regulations that uh, deal with hazardous waste. It's a RICRA non-generator of hazardous waste. Okay, the, just the logical question that one has to ask themselves is how do you get to be a RICRA non-generator? EPA is not driving down the street Looking at businesses going up, oh, nope, non-generator. Yep, you look like you're a generator. Nope, you wouldn't be it. That is not how it happens. The only way you get to be a Rickman non-generator is if you were a generator in the first place and something changed. And in this case, they were a dry cleaner, an active dry cleaner, and they stopped and then they transitioned to a drop-off only location. So the consultant concludes that there's no dry cleaning connected, conducted on the site. And then the only other thing that they, they'll, the other thing that they'll say is, and there's no violations listed in the database report. That doesn't matter. So this, this person is ready to go for permanent financing to close on the deal. And the lender doesn't agree with the conclusions and they wanted to sample anyway. Um, and here's the problem that they're dealing with now. So saved a few hundred bucks on a cheap phase one to get the answer they wanted. And now he's facing a $4 million tax, uh, a tax liability on it, on the expiration of a 1031 exchange. You cannot mess with these things. And yes, they collected some subslab samples. And not, only, and, the, and not only that, when they went to go collect the subslab samples, the old dry cleaning machine was still in the storage room. They never even went in the building or they didn't go far enough in the building to figure it out. And there are impacts and they are migrating off site. This is a bigger problem than what they had uh, anticipated. Uh, there's another one that happened in another part of Utah. It almost exactly the same scenario. Drop off now, consultant says no dry cleaning. It was a RICRA non-generator. That's your first clue that they were a generator to begin with. You could see on the back of the building uh, in, in that tenant space, the vent and the pipe from the old dry cleaning, the buyer purchased it with cash. And so he bought it and then he went to, to get long-term financing. And again, it was the lender who looked at the report and the photographs and he's going, yeah, this is not right. Um, go figure it out. So they did find contamination. So the, the new owner went to the old, uh, the old owner and said, I want my money back. And of course, that didn't work. And included in the litigation, there were a number of parties that were named in the litigation, including the commercial broker 
who made representations to the environmental professional on behalf of his client, who was a, a, an out-of-state owner. Uh, yeah, so dry cleaners are um, a big, don't, and don't mess with those. It, uh, I'm working with one right now, uh, they're looking to buy a piece of, the dry cleaner is just a piece of a larger uh, accumulation of parcels for a bigger development. And uh, yeah, there's issues on the dry cleaner. He's, they're, they're trying to figure out how to do, how to not have to go spend all that money on investigation to try to figure it out. And I, I if you're going to buy the dry cleaner, you have to be prepared for what that means. When EPA, uh, our EPA lia the liaison on our task group, uh, the ASTM task group, she told us the number one source of new Superfund sites are dry cleaners. Our newest Superfund site in Utah is a dry cleaner, the VA hospital up Sunnyside Avenue, right? That's an impacted groundwater and drinking water and it's, don't mess with the dry cleaners. It's simple and easy to screen to see if there even is a problem. And then if there is a problem, it gets expensive very quickly. Make sure you get those uh, answers before you buy it. Because once you buy it, you get to deal with it. Uh, and I have lots of others. There's so many others that I could share with you, but our time was is, is relatively limited. So Barrett, that's what I have for you in a nutshell, if there are any questions or any discussion. Okay, thank you. Fabulous, uh, Julie. That was an uh, excellent overview. Have one question uh, pertaining to lenders' liability. Is the liability uh, the same as a buyer? It's an interesting question, and and it used to be. That's really part of what drove uh, the necessity for AST. It was lenders that came to ASTM to say, "Help us, help protect us," because lenders were getting tagged for EPA Superfund response costs. The, but some legislation came along later that gave lend, lend, uh, lender liability uh, uh, under certain conditions, right? So if you just, your only interest in the property is as a, a, um, is for a collateral, you did not participate in management, but even then, if you have to foreclose, you can participate in management. So to, to wrap up the deal and try to get things flipped, so they have some protections now, but I can tell you that um, the Environmental Bankers Association was formed just for this very purpose, to help lenders protect themselves from environmental liabilities. And there are still lenders that are dragged into litigation. Um, one in particular recently with, over a, a release from the mid 1800s that they had some involvement in. Um, the other thing is, is, is if you don't meet all of these pieces that are in the, in the lender, uh, secured creditor lender exemption, then, then you get pulled in as a responsible party. And that's at the federal level. Let me just say that's at the federal level, because there's a, also a, a very good example of a case in New York. It was a state response action. And what had happened in that case is the, 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 the person knew they were going out of business. And they went to the lender to get an extension on their line of credit to wrap up operations. Well, the lender knew they weren't gonna get their money back. Why would they give them money? And so they said, no. So the manufacturer walks away and big release and contamination and drums tip over and the sprinklers freeze and burst and it washes out. Turned out to be a state problem. The state responded and then the state then tried to tag the lender for recovery of response costs because had the lender given this person the money to wind up operations, this release would not have happened. So the big challenge with lenders is that they are very deep pockets and there is a lot of effort that goes into trying to get some of their money. To drag them in. Okay, thank you. Here's a, a question. Um, you mentioned that something like 80% of dry cleaners have issues. Is there data like this for other categories of businesses? Ooh, not that I, it used to be gas stations, right? Before the underground storage tank regulations went into effect, those were the big driver. And, and I would say the same for them, um, but not other industries, nothing that immediately comes to mind. Dry cleaners have just been such a big problem. And if I may, I'll just tell you the three big factors that make the difference between gas stations and dry cleaners. 
gas stations and underground storage tanks, you typically have a petroleum storage tank fund that everybody pays into. And so you pay a deductible and then the rest of it is paid by the states, number one. Number two, petroleum is regulated non-hazardous, whereas chlorinated solvents for dry cleaners are hazardous. And so they're regulated differently and petroleum goes out to the Salt Lake landfill petroleum, the soil regeneration facility, dry cleaner solvents, depending on how concentrated it is, goes out to the West Desert or for incineration in Nevada, and they charge by the pound. So it's expensive. But the third thing, and perhaps the most important costly thing with dry cleaners, is that the solvents are heavier than groundwater. And so they keep sinking and they migrate differently and they're difficult and expensive to track, to find. And frankly, we're not cleaning these up. We are getting them into a managed state. So they're, they're, it's a big, that's why they're such a big deal. Interesting, okay, thank you. Um, here's one. At a very high level, what does a developer need to do to clean up a former gas station where there had been leakage? Hmm. So it depends. There's two things that I would say. First of all, you want to make sure you don't just look at the gas station. If it's been there very long, you want to also evaluate whether or not there's been service for the two reasons I just talked about. Chlorinated solvents are a game changer and chlorinated solvents were used in repair. Um, so that's the first thing. Clear it for chlorinated solvents. Petroleum, we can manage. Um, what to do to clean it up? It depends. Uh, depends on your development, right? I'm a big fan of opportunist, opportunistic remediation. If I've got a track hoe on site that's doing a demolition, that's a great time to get rid of contaminated soil. And I just need to borrow the track hoe and a couple of dump trucks for a few rounds, depending on how big the problem is. Um, but what you do want to know is you want to know how big that problem is before you go into it. And then you can decide when it makes sense and how it makes sense to do the cleanup. Um, uh, and again, depending on how bad it is, the more of the source material you can get out, the better long term for your development project. But we can do things like um, soil vapor, bar we can do vapor barriers and some vapor extraction, similar to radon systems if you have to. But usually the old gas stations are generally manageable, we do a lot of dig and dumps. There's a lot of magic fairy dust and other things that we can use if we need to, if it gets bigger than that, but it's it's generally a lot of dig and dumps and dewatering okay. of excavations. Okay, thank you. Speak to opportunities uh, that might exist. It seems like there's a tendency to be so afraid of environmental contamination and brown fields. Uh, speak to maybe an example or two where you've seen where people kind of uh, go to the sidelines and then someone else comes in and with a little remediation turns it into a very profitable development. Have you seen that and given experience or, or an example or two? Oh yeah, yeah. So um, where someone maybe has walked away from a property because of contamination, it, it all depends on how, so the developers have a very complex financial model that is way beyond my pay grade, <laughs> but if, one in particular that we've been working on recently where uh, developer after developer had walked away from it, but, but a develop, developer looked at the parcel, they looked at the surrounding areas because that was the problem, the contamination was migrating off site. And what they did is in order to make it pencil out to buy the source area, they bought the surrounding area as well because that's what was part of their development. And then, then they can manage it and, and, and also part of what happened is that the owners, because this is another problem, out of sight, out of mind, they were, they were struggling with having to discount. And in, in this case, they nearly needed to just give the property away because it, the value of it was upside down. So all of those negotiations need to take place on the front end. There's also some opportunity for partnering with the redevelopment agencies um, uh, participating in some grant opportunities or revolving loan funds. The primary challenge with those is that they take a lot of time and there's no certainty that you're gonna get that money. And developers usually don't have that time and lenders generally want more certainty. Interesting, okay, thank you. Here's one, if a developer is doing a joint venture with a landowner, does a new phase one provide a bona fide buyer protection with EPA for the developer who is entering the property? 
Oh, that's a lawyer question because you've got the original landowner as part of the partnership. Uh, that's a tricky question. Um, and I would hesitate to make a legal determination on that. My, my guess is that it would need to be, it depends on maybe how that partnership is structured, right? So what you're saying is you've got one responsible party because they already own it. So they're already in it and they don't have any landowner liability protections, but now you have a developer coming in that's gonna partner with that owner. Can they get their protection? I would consult your environmental attorney on that one. Okay, thank you. Another question, can you provide more information on updating phase one every 180 days? Oh, okay, that's, an, yeah, so that's not a correct interpretation. So it's not that you have to update it every 180 days. But what, what you do is when you're approaching closing, you look to see what, how old your phase one is. And if it's less than a year, but certain components are over 180, 180 days, you need to make sure those components get updated. Um, so you don't have to do it every 180 days. You just, your, your phase one needs to be within a year prior to closing and certain components need to be done within six months. Okay, thank you. Here's another one. What liability, if any, does the producer of an ESA bear mm. if they have missed items of environmental <laughs> concern? That's a good question. The, one of our local consulting firms is going to have to answer here pretty soon because of something that someone's unhappy about. Um, it's, and that's, here's what I see. It depends on how big the problem is. The one that I was telling you about with the bought the cat bought for cash and, and the whole litigation that happened there on this dry cleaner. I asked the lawyers that very question. Why are you not going after the consultant who did this? And they said they were waiting to see how big the problem was going to be because it's expensive to litigate. And uh, yeah, it's, that's a numbers game. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Well, we're just about out of time. So as I, uh, before we got on the call, I was visiting with you a little bit and told you that we, we have uh, students on the call today and uh, some of them are uh, interested in in real estate and maybe pursuing a career in real estate. And I'm sure after today's webinar, some of them were probably seeing a, quite an interest in environmental related issues. We know the, 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 uh, the ESG uh, kind of wave that's going uh, on in uh, all firms and real estate. Uh, what, what could you say to a student who's maybe interested in real estate and environmental are there any career paths, any specialized training, any degrees or universities that tend to focus uh, on the combination? Just maybe speak to our students a little bit about career opportunities. Sure, sure. So, so my focus is in the environmental, so I can more speak to that piece of it. Uh, for, for, uh, for any student who is interested in, in expanding their knowledge on the environmental piece of it is, you know, stay current on your regulations. Um, understand, uh, understand what tools are used to uh, evaluate your environmental concerns uh, prior to uh, purchasing properties. Anybody who's in the environmental field needs to understand the ASTM processes. I, I can't tell you the questions that I get where it's clear that nobody has read, that they haven't read the standard or they're not well versed in it. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and understand the science. If you're going to do the environmental, or the more you can understand about the environmental, you need to understand the science. And it's a moving target. That's why I say stay current. I would mentioned gas stations were the big thing when 20, 30 years ago. Today, it's dry, cleaning, dry cleaners. And we're understanding more about the risk of dry cleaners than we knew 20 years ago. There's a new one on the horizon, the PFAS, the polyfluoroalkyls. Um, that's going to be a big, that's going to be a big issue that nobody even knows where they, where it all is right now. Um, so when you're doing your, your deals, uh, just, and I know I'm biased from the environmental side, just because I see so much of this, but don't get sucker punched by the beer and gas money guys that are offering really low, attractively priced phase ones and giving you answers that you want eight out of 10 times, you'll be fine. Um, but, but guessing is not good. <laughs> uh, you can get yourself upside down on these things in a big hurry. And it's, it's an unpleasant mess when that happens. Great. 
Thank you, Julie. This has been uh, a wonderful uh, time with you, and you're obviously well experienced, well versed in this, and it's been uh, great to have you share with our audience. We hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Great. And for all of you who have joined us today, uh, uh, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to hearing you again uh, shortly uh, in on October 7th when we'll be hosting Don Slythe at Ag Reserves. Have a great afternoon.